Well, good evening. Is everyone, is everyone tired? Yes. I'm sorry, I, I thought I heard a no. That means we're not working, no. I know we're, you guys are working very hard. I want you to know, and I know in the group, in our group, that our faculty has observed dedication, they have observed preparation, they've observed just good-heartedness. And I also want you to know, I've been talking with your other faculty, and they also tell me that they're seeing that in their groups as well. And I just want you to know, on behalf of the faculty, we really pre we appreciate how hard you're working, we appreciate how hard this is. And we thank you for just being good people and digging in and getting this done. So, it is with that that I want to share with you what you're about to see. Because you're about to see two fabulous advocates practicing their craft. The heart of every case, the starting place of every case is the closing argument. It is the alpha, it is the omega. Because you will remember the first thing they tell you. You will remember the last thing they tell you. So listen carefully. And with that, it is my great pleasure and my honor to introduce your prosecutor, Matt McCoy. And your defense counsel, who is, as always, fighting for the rights of the unjustly accused, Liz Markowitz. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, please give your attention to counsel for the prosecution's closing argument. Throughout this trial, we've heard about how Juan Cortez has been surrounded by fellow members of MS-13 since the time he was 14 years old. He was surrounded by MS-13 members when he was a juvenile delinquent committing crimes. He was surrounded by MS-13 members when he went to prison the first time. You heard him tell how, when he was in prison the first time, he learned how to be a better gangster, how to be a better member of MS-13, and how when he got out, they gave him a promotion. They put him in charge of running other MS-13 members. And then when he went to jail the second time, he again was surrounded by members of MS-13. And how he got out and hired MS-13 members, fellow convicted felons, to work in his garage. Seventy percent of the people who worked in his garage were MS-13 members. Today, finally, Juan Cortez isn't surrounded by MS-13. He's alone. He's surrounded by the evidence of his guilt. Today, the evidence that was presented establishes beyond any doubt that Juan Cortez planned and executed the armed robbery at Herman's Restaurant. What was that evidence? Well, you remember, Lewis Grimes came and he took the witness stand, raised his hand, swore to tell the truth, and he told you in his own words how when he got out of prison, he sought out his friend from prison, Juan Cortez. He sought him out because he had heard that Juan was able to help ex-cons make money. That when he went and talked to Juan Cortez, Juan said, the garage, it's just a front. What I'm really doing is I'm running drugs, and you can help. And then how, shortly after that, Juan told him, we've got trouble, the garage burned down, and I don't have that operation to run drugs out of. And so, I'm going to get into the protection racket. 
I'm going to make shop owners, restaurant owners, pay me money so that bad things don't happen to their restaurants. And you, you can help me. I've been staking out this place, Herman's Restaurant. I've gone there and said, you need to pay protection money. But the old man, he's not going to pay it. So we need to show him. Take this gun. Take this 38. File off the serial number. And I'll give you a text and pick you up on my bike. And we'll go to Herman's. And I'll stand at the door because they might recognize me. But you, you go in and rob the patrons. And then they'll know that they have to pay us the protection money. You heard Lewis Grimes tell you that that's exactly what they did. That he got the text from Juan Cortez. I'm on my way. And then he got on the back of the bike. They went to Herman's. He went in with the gun. He pointed the gun at the patrons. You heard about he took that one patron's gold Rolex, took other patrons' goods, put them in the bag. How Herman Schmidt fought back, fired, and in the ensuing gunfight, Herman Schmidt's young son died. That's the testimony from Lewis Grimes. Now the law says that a co-defendant's testimony, standing alone, is not sufficient to support a conviction. There has to be corroboration to the co-defendant's statement. And so what corroboration did we have in this case? We had a lot, right? What was found at the crime scene? Juan Cortez's 38. Juan Cortez's 38 is at the crime scene with Lewis Grimes. How could Juan Cortez's 38 have gotten to the robbery with Lewis Grimes if Juan Cortez wasn't involved? It's ludicrous to think that it's possible for his 38 to get to the crime scene and the armed robbery without Juan Cortez's involvement. We have the victim's identification at the scene. It's you. If he had seen him the week before when he came in and tried to shake down Hermans. We have the motorcycle. Poor Herman Schmidt. His son dying on the floor. He runs to the door. He looks out and he sees the black motorcycle carrying the robber, carrying the murderer away. And he sees on the license plate, C-Y. And we know that Juan Cortez has a black motorcycle. And we know that the license plate of Juan Cortez's black motorcycle begins with G-Y. That is corroboration of the testimony of Lewis Grimes. And that is sufficient to convict Juan Cortez. Evidence is overwhelming that Juan Cortez planned and participated in the armed robbery at Herman's restaurant. Let's talk just a minute about the law. The judge is going to charge you about the law. If I could have slide 158. The judge is going to tell you what law you have to apply to the facts that you find in this case. The judge is going to charge you about armed robbery. Okay? And the judge is going to tell you that under the criminal code of the state of Emory, a person commits the crime of armed robbery if he or one with whom he participates, okay, that would be Lewis Grimes, takes property of another person or the immediate presence of another by use of an offensive weapon. 
And that's what happened here. Louis Grimes used Juan Cortez's gun to take the patrons of Herman's Restaurant's possessions, the gold Rolex, the wallets, the other things that were recovered at the scene. That's what armed robbery is. And that's what we've proven beyond a doubt. The judge is also going to tell you about the burden of proof. The burden of proof in this case rests on the state. It have slide 153. And the burden that the state has is proving the guilt of the defendant beyond a reasonable doubt. Now, you're not going to hear the judge say that the state, in order to meet its burden, has to prove Juan Cortez's guilt to a mathematical certainty. You're not going to hear the judge say that the state, in order to meet its burden of proof, has to prove Juan Cortez's guilt to scientific certainty. And the judge isn't going to tell you that the state has to prove Juan Cortez's guilt beyond any doubt. The burden I have, the burden I've met, is proving Juan Cortez's guilt beyond a reasonable doubt. That's all. I'm going to sit down now, and Ms. Markowitz is going to get up, and she's going to talk to you on behalf of Juan Cortez. Now, I really have three things that I don't understand, and I'm hoping that Ms. Markowitz will explain them. First and foremost, you'll recall an opening. There was talk about an alibi. I don't understand what they're talking about. There's no alibi in this case. Juan Cortez, on his own evidence, is alone from 8.30 at night when his wife goes downstairs to watch TV with the kids till 10 o'clock at night when Pastor Unger shows up at the house. That's an hour and a half where none of his witnesses can testify about his whereabouts. Ours did. They said he was there at Herman's, committing the armed robbery. So there's no alibi in this case. And then the gun. How, how does the gun get there if Juan Cortez isn't the one planning it, isn't the one making it happen? And finally, you remember when Lewis Grimes was on the stand, Ms. Markowitz went after him, went after him pretty hard about this super duper plea deal that he got, right? Sounded like he had won the lottery. The truth is, Lewis Grimes pled guilty and he's sentenced to five years in prison. He's going to hit the door of that prison marked marked as a snitch. Every single MS-13 member in that prison is going to be gunning for him for five years. He's going to be hoping all he gets is stitches. It will be the longest five years of his life if he's lucky enough to make it. Ladies and gentlemen, please give your attention to counsel for the defense closing argument.
Garbage in, garbage out. We talked about that from jury selection and an opening statement. The ultimate question, what I told you from the very beginning of this case, was not, was there a death? There was a death. Not, was there an armed robbery? There was an armed robbery. The question I told you that you would have to ask yourselves, the question that Mr. McCoy would have to answer for you beyond a reasonable doubt was, who was with Lewis Grimes on March the 9th, 2010? Mr. McCoy has stood up here and told you that he has proven his case beyond a reasonable doubt. And I'll tell you what he has proven to you beyond a reasonable doubt. He has proven beyond a reasonable doubt that Lewis Grimes is guilty. What he hasn't proven beyond a reasonable, beyond a reasonable doubt is who was with Lewis Grimes. What is reasonable doubt? It is not two sides. It is, that is not enough. It is not who has two witnesses, who has more witnesses on each side. That is not enough. It is just what it says. It is a doubt for which you can attach a reason, and the law requires you to acquit. The fact that only a perpetrator, Lewis Grimes, garbage, comes in here and makes an identification, that is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. If you think, you go back in the jury room and talk about it and you say to yourselves, I think Juan Cortez might have done it. I kind of feel like he did. The law requires you. Judge Williams will tell you, you are required to return a verdict of not guilty. Because thinking and feeling is not proof beyond a reasonable doubt. If you still have a question, if you would have liked to have heard from one of the at least 64 people who were dining at Herman's restaurant on March the 9th of 2010, Anyone who might have been able to identify who was standing at the door and shot Joseph Schmidt, other than Lewis Grimes. That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason, and the law requires you to acquit. I submit that the reason you have not heard from anyone other than Lewis Grimes is that there is no one else because Juan Cortez was not there. You do not all have to have the same doubts. You just have to have a doubt. You do not leave your common sense at home. The fact remains that the only person that the state bases their case on is the man who unapologetically got on this stand, who could not hold the smirk back from his face, who admitted to carrying out an armed robbery to walking into the middle of a crowded restaurant, standing in the middle of a restaurant, holding his hand up with a loaded weapon and demanding that individual people place their personal items in a bag or he would shoot them. And the state wants you to believe him. Garbage in, garbage out. How did Lewis Grimes come up with this? Think about that. Who was the first person to put Juan Cortez's name in this case? 
not Lewis Grimes. Lewis Grimes didn't tell Officer Moss, hey, I've got some information for you. Let me give you information. Officer Moss said, here's the deal. We know who your partner is. And Lewis Grimes said, what's in it for me? And Officer Moss didn't say, hey, tell me what you got. Officer Moss said, hold, oh, please. Let me go talk to Mr. McCoy. I'll be right back. And he goes and talks to the state, and he comes back, and he tells Lewis Grimes, here's the deal. You give up your partner, Juan Cortez. You got a deal. He, the state, gives him the name of the person they want to be standing at the door. That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and the law requires you to acquit. Let's talk about the different types of evidence. There's what we call direct evidence and what there's called as circumstantial evidence. Circumstantial evidence is similar to um, a chain link fence or chains in a necklace, individual chains that are held together. And what the law says is that you have to exclude every other reasonable hypothesis except for the guilt of Mr. Cortez. In this particular case, the chains, if they break, you must acquit. Let's talk about Mr. Z and this Mr. C that the state so strongly wants you to hold on to. Mr. Schmidt. And I feel sorry for Mr. Schmidt, but that feeling sorry for Mr. Schmidt for the loss of his son is not what this case is about. Mr. Schmidt told you that his son told him that there had been someone, either a Mr. Z or a Mr. C, and he didn't know who it was, who had been threatening Herman's business. And Mr. Schmidt's information and what he thought was that night, that same person had come into the restaurant to carry out that threat. When it turns out that it's Mr. Z, and I would submit to you it is Mr. Z, to answer Mr. McCoy's question in one moment, but let me finish my thought. When it turns out it is Mr. Z, that is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. The reason they want it to be Mr. C and not Mr. Z is because otherwise they have the wrong man on trial. So if you can't be sure because there's no direct evidence or circumstantial evidence that it's a Mr. C or a Mr. Z. That is a doubt that the law requires you to acquit. How do we know that it's Mr. Z? We know that it's Mr. Z because if Lewis Grimes, as a member of MS-13, turns over a current gang member, Mr. Z. He's a dead man. But if he turns over a former member who tried to get out, he's a hero. 
He won that lottery. That lottery that Mr. McCoy just mentioned, that is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and the law requires you to acquit. Alibi. You are going to hear evidence about alibi in the law from the judge. And Mr. McCoy wants to talk to you about um, there not being an alibi. And I would disagree with you. The law, as the judge will tell you, is that the state has the burden of proof. They have the burden of proof in this case to prove each and every element. And that means that the state has, has to prove, one, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that um, Mr. Cortez is guilty of the homicide. Okay? But they also have to prove, because we have a, put forth an affirmative defense of alibi, they have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that it is impossible for Juan Cortez to have been anywhere else except Herman's restaurant. And we know they can't do that because we know he was at home. The fact that they're saying that no one else can say because they weren't sitting right next to him on the couch does not mean that he doesn't have an alibi. The fact that that's what he's arguing to you is a doubt for which you can attach a reason and you must acquit. Let's talk about the alibi. I would have loved for the alibi to have been an airtight alibi. But if I had asked any one of you, or if you had been asked, where were you on March 9th, 2010? I would gather to say that many of you who had been watching the Emory versus USC game would have said, I was at home. And some of you would have had the unfortunate circumstance, the same circumstance that Juan Cortez found himself in, which was watching the game upstairs by himself, waiting for a friend to come over. But interestingly enough in this case is Juan Cortez was lucky enough that he had planned earlier to get together with Pastor Unger because he loved Emory. He loved Emory basketball and he always wore the same outfit, his lucky outfit, the hat, the jersey, the shorts, and he and Pastor Unger had planned to watch the championship game together. They were going to have dinner at 8.30. Maria told you that. Pastor Unger told you that. And unfortunately, the plans changed. Because at 8.30, Pastor Unger called and said, hey, I'm going to be late. But I'll be there before 10. Not I'm going to be there at 10. So the state... In order, I guess they're thinking he's got an extra plan in his back pocket, you'd have to think that Juan knows that Pastor Unger is going to be there exactly at 10 o'clock. Because what would have happened if Pastor Unger had shown back up at 9.45, 9.30? That doesn't even make sense what his argument is. That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason, and you must acquit. Pastor Unger told you, it is difficult to get out of the gang, but it is not impossible. And you do that by surrounding yourself with your community. And not only do you surround yourself with your community, but you actively participate with your community. And Juan Cortez did just that. He was an active member of his church, and he was an active mentor. 
And you know what? That came back to bite him. Because he tried to mem mentor Lewis Grimes, who he thought was trying to be like him. And he invited him over to his house. Not one time, not two times, but four times. And you know what Lewis Grimes did in return? Here's, I'd like to answer your question. He stole his gun. That's how the gun gets at the scene. The fact remains that the questions that he's asking, the questions that the state is asking can be answered is a doubt for which you can attach a reason. Because I guarantee you that Mr. McCoy did not think that there was an answer to that question. Use your common sense. The fact remains that if we had been in a situation where there was someone, anyone else, who could have made an identification, we would have been in a very different situation. <clears throat> But let's talk about the garbage. Because that's what it really boils down to. Who is Lewis Grimes? His criminal history is full of violence. Burglary, robbery, and now armed robbery and murder. He's not only looking at a life sentence, but he was looking at a life sentence plus 50 years. And what did he get? A life sentence? No. A 50-year sentence? No. A 40-year sentence? No. What did the state say to Lewis Grimes? The state looked at Lewis Grimes and essentially said, Lewis, what can we do for you? They didn't even give him a 10-year prison sentence. They basically gave him a slap on the wrist. And what does he have to do for that? He has to say it was Juan Cortez. That's all he has to do. And let me ask you a question. What do you think would have happened if Lewis Grimes had gotten on the stand and decided to actually name who was standing at the door for real? You think he still would have gotten his five-year sentence? Why don't you ask and answer that question for us, Mr. McCoy? And one final thought. You can't change your mind after your verdict today. Your verdict is a final verdict. But I leave you with this. Would you give Lewis Grimes your tuition for next year? just to hold for three weeks. Would you give Lewis Grimes the down payment on your house just to hold for two weeks? And I would submit to you that the answer to that question is no, because you don't trust Lewis Grimes. And if you don't trust Lewis Grimes with your important things, why would you trust them for Juan Cortez? Why would you trust them for that important decision? That is a doubt for which you can attach a reason, and you must acquit. I am confident 
that after having heard all of the evidence, that you will return the only verdict that speaks the truth. You will find Juan Cortez not guilty on all counts. Thank you. Please give your attention to Mr. McCoy's rebuttal. You have three minutes, counsel. There is no such thing as a former member of MS-13. Blood in, blood out. The only former members of MS-13 are dead and in hell. Now, Ms. Markowitz picked up and ran with Juan Cortez's testimony. You remember his testimony? He said, I took in this fallen fellow, Lewis Grimes. I brought him into my house and I was going to show him the path the path to righteousness, the path to salvation. And what did I do when I had him in my house? To show him the way. I said, hey, man, look at my gun. <laughs> I'm a convicted felon, but I got a gun. Maybe you should get one. That's the path? That's the path. It's not the path to salvation. It's the path back to being an active member of MS-13. Use your common sense. What kind of mentor, other than a criminal gangster mentor, says to the recently released convicted felon, look at my gun. I mean, what are we talking about? I'm not going to waste our time on that. Let's talk about the facts. Let's talk about the actual facts that show that Juan Cortez committed the armed robbery at Herman's restaurant, okay? Now we know that Juan Cortez belongs to MS-13. We know that Grimes met Juan Cortez in prison. We know that the defendant, Juan Cortez, was Big C in prison. We know that when Lewis Grimes gets out of prison, the first place he goes is to visit Big C, because Big C helps ex-cons earn money. Okay? We know Big C had a gun. Not supposed to have a gun as a convicted felon. He doesn't care, right? He's not on the path of righteousness. He's on the path <coughs> for more crime. Big C owns a black motorcycle. Black motorcycle used in the armed robbery. Big C's garage burns down. Big C is in financial trouble. Big C's license plate on his black motorcycle, GY or CY, just as identified by Mr. Schmidt. Big C's gun is used in the armed robbery. Not Big Z's. The gun in the armed robbery has Big C's fingerprint on it. MS-13 is for life. Blood in, blood out. Turn a verdict that speaks the truth. A verdict that speaks justice. A verdict guilty.